Yeah, it's wonderful to get invited over here. And um, uh, this is meant to be an informal-ish uh, seminar, so I'll try to leave enough room at the end for questions and discussion. But if you've got questions as we're going along, please feel comfortable to just shout them out. All right, so I'm going to talk about ospreys and why they're an ideal species for thinking about issues that all of you are uh, thinking about restoration um, and what they can tell us about the health of aquatic systems. And um, I put ro my buddy colleague Rob Dominich up here. Rob is the executive director of Raptor View Research Institute in Missoula, and he's one of the leading raptor experts in the world. So uh, he essentially started this project way long ago, and um, we've teamed up uh, since then. So everything I'm going to tell you about is done in collaboration with Rob. I'd also like to say, just um, get this out of the way before we get going so we don't forget about it, that <clears throat> everything I'm going to tell you about today is uh, due to lots and lots of people and organizations that have made this happen. Uh, probably first and foremost is the Natural Resources Damage Program, which has helped support the Clark Fork Watershed Education Program. So Ray Lynn is in the back there, raise your hand. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is also done in collaboration and under the broad umbrella of CFWEP. So every, there's seats up here if you want. Um, and so CFWEP uh, is, has been an integral partner where we work together on this. Um, I'd also like to, so lots of people have chipped in, and I'd also like to highlight Northwestern Energy and Sam Mila Dragovich, who's been the longtime Osprey expert with Northwestern Energy. We've worked together for years and years on Osprey stuff, and they've been very supportive of our research over the years. All right. Uh, we have this thing, this beast we call the Montana Osprey Project, and it's sort of a three-legged stool involving research, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about today, or quite a bit about today, and a lot of education and conservation. So we um, do lots of different things, um, all under the umbrella of ospreys. And so I'm going to give you a sense, going to skim over lots of stuff, but give you an idea of this sort of divorced portfolio of uh, programs, research, and educational programs we're working on. And most of it is focused right here in the Clark Fork watershed. I've worked on ospreys um, all over the world, but um, I actually did my undergraduate senior thesis in Nova Scotia on ospreys way, way, way long ago, so it's been super fun to come back to them here. All right, so I'm going to geek out a little bit on ospreys now because they, they're just so totally cool. Um, so ospreys um, are aquatic organisms. They, 100% pretty much, of their diet is made up of fish. So even though they live outside the water for all intents and purposes, they are aquatic organisms. They are highly, highly specialized to catch fish. Um, Lots of very, very neat adaptations. There's one species of osprey, and it's found on all continents except the Antarctic, all over the world. And it's, a, it's in its own family, which is kind of weird. It's so specialized for what it does that there's only one osprey in, in this pretty big family. Uh, so they're very, very neat, and this is what they're really good at doing, catching fish. And in fact, um, they're, they're so good that occasionally they can do this. And um, I said I would geek out, and I'm going to. I want to just show you a couple of videos. How, how many people here have seen ospreys catch fish? Oh, well, I'm talking to the converted, but come on in. There's seats up here. Um, but I wanted to show you a few things, a few movies, um, and point out a few things.
So this was filmed in Scotland. This is a young male that is latched onto a really big trout. So big that it, it might pull him under. But a big trout can match him weight for weight. And the instinct of the fish is to swim down. There are tales of weak and hungry ospreys being dragged to the bottom, unable to release the fish or lift off from the water successfully. Okay, now I want you to watch the first wing beat and see how it, its wings work to get it off the water. But osprey wings are adapted to give maximum lift from the water. And this male is young and strong. See on this first flap, it barely touches the water. It's not going like this. It's generating thrust up that way. <clears throat> so ospreys, their pectoral muscles, which are responsible for getting them off the water, and they can uh, carry fish that are maybe two or three times their body mass. Their pectoral muscles are about a third of their entire body weight. Okay, so if we had our pecs were a third of our body mass, we'd all look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Yeah, right. He can't let go of that, can he? It, it's hard, it's hard. Um, yeah, they can't really let go. I want to show you one more. This is filmed by a buddy of mine in Newfoundland. And I want you to watch when it commits to the dive. That's a flounder, which changes colors to match the, the bottom. So I don't even know how the hell they see these things. Okay, here it commits to the dive. Okay, you students, watch what it does with its wings just before it hits. Okay, any of you ever done a belly flop? <laughs> yeah, so what did it do with its wings? Just, it, yeah, it put them straight back. So they go in like Olympic divers. If they hit, they can hit the water going 100 miles an hour. If they had their wings out, it would just rip them off. So they tend to go in like Olympic divers like that. <clears throat> and just one more. This has got take the prize for grab and go, take out food for osprey. These are capelin spawning in Newfoundland. <laughs> All right, so you get the point. Ospreys are really good fishing birds, highly, highly specialized. The reason we, that ospreys are useful to study ecotoxicology and questions that are of concern in places like the Clark Fork River is they are what are called apex predators. They're at the very top of the aquatic food chain. So they eat big fish that are eating smaller fish, that eat smaller fish, that eat smaller things and so forth. And because they're at the top of the food chain, there's a very important biological, ecological process called bioamplification. So as you move up a food chain, if there's, say, toxins in the environment, every step up the food chain, uh, you get an increase, a magnification in those toxins. And the easiest way to think about it is, say, these little fish are eating, you know, 100 little macro invertebrates. They're going to get the toxins in all those 100 macro invertebrates. And a big fish, if it eats 100 of these little fish, it'll get the toxins in those 100 smaller fish, and so on and so forth. And as a rough rule of thumb, as you move up trophic levels in aquatic systems, uh, the increase in concentration in toxins is roughly about um, a tenfold increase, sometimes more. So ospreys at the very top of these 
aquatic food chains can, as we will see, um, um, have super magnified concentrations of crud that might be in the system. And so one of the reasons that we can use ospreys to tell us about the health of aquatic systems is precisely this. They integrate the ecological food webs uh, that they're sitting on top of. Also, this is of concern because we're at the same sort of trophic level when we eat big fish out of rivers, we're, getting the, we're eating the same sort of fish that the ospreys are. So if we're seeing problems with ospreys, this might have implications for human health. Okay. One of the other reasons that it's really easy and fun and convenient to study ospreys is, I like to say you just add water and you've got ospreys. As I said, they nest on all continents, or they, they're found on all continents except Antarctic, from really, really remote wilderness areas. It's a little hard to see, but there's an osprey nest in a natural snag way up in the top there. But they, if the fishing is good, they don't care. So. Um, <laughs> Here is the nest that used to be at, at the Missoula Ospreys. Um, so this is, there's thousands of people that go underneath this nest uh, during the summer. However, the team was just bought and they changed the name from Missoula Osprey to the Paddleheads. And um, we've been working hard to try to clean up the river with monofilament line and stuff and so on the new mascot there's a damn monofilament line caught on this They're the new mascot so um, I'm, I'm really angry <laughs> anyway so this is in downtown Missoula here's one of my favorite osprey nests this is um, in just outside of Missoula this is in this thing actually works and so the ospreys built a nest up on it and like once a summer, twice a summer, the rancher would come and fire this thing up just so the engine wouldn't see, seize up. He'd drive it around a little bit, and the ospreys would sort of bump along on the top. <laughs> so they're very, very tolerant of human activities. And you folks know you drive along the interstate, along the highway, um, and Sam, Sam knows better than anybody that they love to nest on, on power poles. Um, all right. so. Now I'm going to focus on you know, this big Superfund site we're, we're sitting on top of. So Missoula up there and you guys down here. Normally at this point, if I was giving a seminar, most people wouldn't know what a Superfund site is or what, where Butte is or anything. I, I won't go into that because you folks are at ground zero and you are living and breathing and breathing it. So what I'm going to do is tell you about what we've, how we've been using ospreys to look at what's going on in this important Superfund site for the last almost 15 years now. So a little bit about methods. We have a network of um, well over 200 osprey nests actually all around um, the western states, but you can see that we've got a lot. Um, here's Missoula here. This is the Blackfoot River coming in, the Bitterroot. Um, the little black foot, and so on. Uh, so you can see that there's a lot of osprey nests um, in this section of the Clark Fork. And we designed this study so that we could sample the blood and feathers of osprey chicks before, during, and after the removal of Milltown Dam and uh, the restoration and remediation process. Okay, so we've got a really valuable uh, set of data that from the blood of these ospreys that's telling us about what's going on in the river before, during, and after. And here's what we do. We go out and um, do alien abductions at these osprey nests when the chicks are about yay big. We grab the chicks, bring them down um, to the ground. <clears throat> that's what it looks like typically when you go up. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of baling twine usually in nests if they're out around ag land at all. So that's another whole story, but uh, we've been doing a lot of work on that. So we band them um, and we make them honorary members of the Osprey baseball team. <laughs> and we take small blood samples from the brachial vein and um, small feather samples. Now we can catch adults. We know how to do that. But let me ask the students. 
to do this ecotoxicology study, we're really focusing on the chicks. The, ch the blood of the chicks is way more valuable for our questions than, say, blood of adults. Why might that be? They haven't traveled. So where are ospreys right now? They're sensible. They're sitting on like sandy, sunny beaches in Costa Rica and places like that. So adult ospreys spend actually more of their life not here, down on their wintering grounds, than here. So if we took the blood from adult ospreys and there was crud in it, we wouldn't know where they picked it up, right? It could have been in Peru on top of a gold mine or something. So it's ambiguous. We can't really say, you know, where did the, these adult ospreys get that crud? If you think about it, all of that biomass from a chick, all of that biomass was grown from fish caught within a mile or so of that nest. So that blood of that chick and the feathers of that chick tell us about the aquatic conditions pretty close to that nest. So by sampling blood and feathers from nests all over the place, we can come up with super high resolution maps of the sort of ecotoxicology picture, okay? So that's our rationale, that's what we do. And uh, the samples are analyzed in our um, ecotoxicology lab at University of Montana. And I used to show boring static graphs like this that were hard to explain. We've been focusing on the big five he heavy metals that uh, motivated the Superfund designation. So arsenic, copper, zinc, lead, cadmium, we, um, selenium as well, but um, we've also focused on mercury. And that's a, turning out to be a big part of the story for ospreys in the river. It's not associated with the Superfund designation, but Osprey is important. But um, what I'm going to do is instead I'm going to, we've been working hard on better ways to show these data, and I want to show you some interactive um, maps that are, are pretty cool. And these have been put together by our GIS goddess, uh, Trish Rodriguez. And so the point I want you to get, I'm going to focus on arsenic, two stories, arsenic and mercury. Um, and what I want you to come away with is that um, the, the levels of these toxins can be really dynamic in both in space, where you are on the river, and also in time. For a long time, for many, many, many years, the arsenic levels in ospreys were pretty constant over time. They didn't change much from year to year. But then along came 2018. And <clears throat> so I want to show you some of these data with this cool map that Trish put together. And this is uh, available. Uh, we're making this freely available, so if you're interested in this, um, let me know and I can uh, get you the link. But here's how this works. So Missoula is way up, up there. <clears throat> um, here is the Clark Fork. We're sitting down here. Uh, Warm Springs, Deer Lodge. Here's the Little Blackfoot and so forth. Now, the width of the ribbon along the, a creek or a river is proportional to the amount of arsenic in the sediment at that place. These dots are osprey nests. And the size of the circle uh, is proportional to the um, amount of arsenic, in this case, uh, in, in the blood of those osprey chicks. Now, <clears throat> this is a pretty cool map because, well, you can zoom in and zoom out. Whoops, go away. And you can do things like you can click on the river, and it will give you what the concentration of arsenic in the sediments, um, an average during those three years, was right there. You can click on a nest. So here is uh, the racetrack nest. So it had about 200 micrograms per liter. Um, that year. Now, I'm going to zoom back out a little bit. 
show the whole study area. All right, what I'm going to do is swipe this over. So those are data that are 10 years old and older. And for a lot of years, it was they were pretty constant. You can see that, in general, the arsenic levels were a bit higher up here, uh, where the, the source of the stuff. And as you go down the river, the levels of arsenic um, tend to decrease. So for example, when we get down to Missoula, it was about 14. Okay. Now watch what happens in 2008. This was a big surprise when we went out and got the samples. Okay, so uh, there, this is a really interesting and kind of disturbing pattern. What we see is that when we look at, so here's Warm Springs Nest. Look at that little bitty, not much mercury. That's, I mean, arsenic. That's actually a, not a bad level. We, we're not worried about arsenic levels in, in that range. So 2018, Warm Spring was fine. Here's Galen. Uh, again, not much mercury. But when we get up to, this is a racetrack. It's creeping up. When we get up to, this is Grant Corps Ranch. It's over a thousand. It just went through the roof, um, the amount of, of <coughs> arsenic. And then <clears throat> if we look that year down the river, you can see there's no more samples until we get way down to Missoula. Um, all the osprey chicks that year died from um, Deer Lodge on down. There were no osprey chicks for us to sample in that year, which was the first year that had ever happened. And if we look you know, down near Missoula, you can see that the levels are, are low. And so 2018, um, something really dramatic happened. And so let me just, I could do this all day, play around with this. But this is a really cool interactive dynamic map with lots of data layers underneath it. And you can just click on it and get lots of data. Um, so if you're interested in that, let me know and I can make it available. <clears throat> and so what went on in 2018? It was sort of a perfect storm in many ways. There was remediation going on during those years. Um, here is Deer Lodge up here. So there was active digging up of and exposing of stuff. And then, um, if you remember, that was a super, super high flood year. So lots of water and then um, some really barn burner uh, uh, rainstorms, thunder, thunder showers, that a lot of rain came down. And so there was a lot of water going through this, uh, both um, down the river and um, rain coming in from the sides as well. And so there was active stuff going on right at Deer Lodge where that arsenic spiked. And I was flying, this was the year of the floods, this, I was flying over Missoula, and, and this is the year that down at Missoula things were um, really flooded out. This is in Missoula, that fishing sign is usually about 50 feet from the river bank, so you can see there's a ton of water coming down that year. And that was the year, I think you had a talk not too long ago, about the, the fish kills, yes. right? Yeah. Alex, Alex yeah. Leon. And, yeah. 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 And so here's um, a photo near Warm Springs, actually, of a, a slick. And so it was this sort of stuff that was being, um, rain was washing these banks out. So there were situations like this. So a lot of exposed, um, contaminated stuff was ending up in the river. Um, all right. so. It's been, so what we've learned from ospreys and the fish dying off um, is that, you know, we can't take 10 years, we can't assume what we saw the previous 10 years is, is what's happening all the time, right? There were low and stable arsenic levels for a decade, and then 2018 hit and um, things really <laughs> changed. And this may be important for guiding as we move forward some of our how folks go about remediating stuff. Okay, so that's the arsenic story. I also want to tell you about the mercury story. Um, the copper story, by the way, is similar to the arsenic 
So a lot of copper washed into the river and it's toxic to fish and other things as well. So the copper story looks very similar to the, the arsenic story. Now, when we started this, we decide, this research, we decided to uh, look at mercury levels. Even though mercury is not used in extracting copper, it's not in the rocks here, um, but we um, serendipitously decided to look at uh, mercury anyway. And I'm gonna tell you about mercury poisoning. So in humans, so mercury is one of the most toxic elements on earth for developing vertebrates. In people, mercury poisoning is called Minamata disease, and it's named after Minamata, which is a Japanese fishing village. This is a really powerful photo. So this is Ryoko, who was um, lived in this fishing village, and there was a plastics factory in Minamata that dumped methyl mercury that was used in making plastics right into the ocean. It got into the food chain, into the fish, and so Ryoko was eating fish um, while she was pregnant with her daughter, Tomoko. And you can see she's um, really messed up. And Tomoko died not long after this photo was taken. Um, the fellow who took this photo, Eugene Smith, it's an interesting history. He published this in Life magazine and got a Pulitzer Prize for these, this set of photos. Um, the plastic factory in Japan, they didn't like this bad PR and they sent goons out and they beat him up. He almost died because of this photo. They broke his legs and his arms and he, he almost went blind. And so he paid a, a hefty price to get this story out. So we know that mercury in extremely, extremely small doses um, messes up developing vertebrate systems especially. And I want you to bear this in mind. Um, the upper limit that has been set for mercury levels in, say, human blood. It's considered anything above five micrograms of mercury per kilogram of blood is considered um, unsafe. Anything above that is, is considered bad news. And what, what is that? This is about five parts per billion, roughly. So if you can imagine a billion parts of your blood and five parts is mercury, that's not much five parts in a billion. So this is a very, very, very minute dose of mercury. Um, let me show you the mercury story. Okay, mercury's remained the same over time. It hasn't shown huge things like the arsenic did. And so what I'm gonna show you is the pattern in, in the, the watershed here. So you can see that there's really, really low levels of mercury down at this end. And in fact, Sam and I have joked that if you wanna be a healthy osprey chick, anywhere in the Clark Fork, upper Clark Fork River, the best place to be an osprey chick is at Warm Springs. Um, and so Warm Springs is up here. See, some of these dots are so small you can't even see them. Um, so there's one milligram per kilogram of blood. But then we noticed immediately um, this very striking pattern. Mercury in the osprey chicks and the, and the blood shot through the roof at Drummond. And what goes on in Drummond? I think I heard it. Flint Creek. Flint Creek comes in at Drummond. So Drummond's right there, and here's Flint Creek coming in. Phillipsburg is back here, so there were uh, major gold and silver mining operations at a couple places up here, and there's hu huge concentrations of mercury. The major source of mercury in the Clark Fork system is coming in right at Little Old Drummond. So these poor ospreys there are just loaded with mercury. So they've got um, you know, this much mercury in them. We've had ospreys with um, over 1,500 parts per billion. So imagine five parts per billion. Um, 1,500 parts is considered the upper limit for what's safe in humans. So these poor osprey chicks are loaded with mercury in a lot of areas. Um, and this 
there's Missoula, but this high level of mercury, actually, I, I haven't put the date on here, but a high level all, like way, way, way down um, the Clark Fork River. So we've got a mercury problem. One of the, yes, Joe. I was, I was just gonna point out that they, did, this is a copper camp, but mm -hmm. it was also a silver camp, really, before it was a copper camp. And the amalgamated silver with mercury. Yeah, so that's high a, up on the hill. Yeah, it just does. It doesn't seem to get into the watershed. Yeah, so, so yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, so th it, thank you for pointing that out. So there's just it depends on the local vagaries of how and how and where the miners extracted the gold and whether the mercury they used ended up in the the water or is still up in the the hills. So thank goodness or you know, there'd be these big, huge dots all the way down. Okay, so, um, here's just another way of showing the levels of the mercury in these various tributaries of the Clark Fork. So you can see all this, most of the mercury in the upper Clark Fork system is coming into Flint Creek. And, <coughs> So I was flying over Drummond. This is little bitty Flint Creek coming in here. So places you can actually, you know, jump over the creek, right? So it's a pretty tiny creek, and yet this is where the major loading of mercury into the Clark Fork is coming in. Uh, because of some of this work with ospreys and mercury, uh, there's now um, remediation efforts going on um, down um, Flint Creek in one place. Um, it's harder to get into the main place. Um, the fellow who owns it won't, doesn't want people on restoring his land. Um, but um, the state is starting to take the mercury issue really seriously. Um, and again, this is just another way of showing these data. So here's Warm Springs, and this is working down the river. So Drummond, um, Missoula, Alberton, Tarkia, way down. And so what I want to point out is that even though I said the mercury levels were low, say up at Warm Springs, there's still, there's the upper level that's considered safe for humans. Okay, so basically every single osprey chick in the whole Clark Fork system is way above what's considered safe. So if you or I walked into the hospital with those mercury levels, the doctors would be freaking out and pushing the code red button okay and starting to try to get you some chelation therapy and stuff so um, there's a lot of mercury in in the system so one of the questions we were got interested in is like okay i showed you that picture of poor little japanese girl messed up with minamata disease um, we still see these osprey chicks with super high levels but to us they look like normal ospreys and so we were trying to figure out, this has got to be, you know, what consequences is having for the reproduction? So we used um, early drones and um, helicopters we built ourselves, and fly them over nests and uh, take pictures. And so we can get um, data like this. And um, so this is an area of high mercury along the river. And this is typically what we see. Maybe one chick hatched and dead eggs that failed to hatch. In areas of lower mercury, the hatching success is pretty close to 100%. Every egg almost hatches. In areas of high mercury, there's about a 50% egg mortality. So, I mean, imagine that 50% of pregnant women in some of these areas were losing their babies. It's kind of similar. And so every time we would go out to high mercury areas, we would come back full of, with buckets full of dead eggs that failed to hatch, okay? So it is a problem. We still don't understand why the chicks that do hatch, they seem to do okay. There's, they, there's normal fledging success and so forth. So I've got some ideas. We're still working on that, but um, it's interesting. But a huge um, reduction in hatching success apparently because of the mercury. Sam? Are you seeing, are you getting bad returns from those chicks? Are they returning? Are they, are they uh, um, surviving? The you know, we don't, we're just getting to the point where we're starting to get large enough sample sizes because osprey chicks don't really um, start to breed till they're four or five 
years old, six years old sometimes, and they often don't come back to near where they were born. So it's a needle in a haystack, but we're starting to build up enough of resightings um, that we'll be able to, to answer that. But no, right now we don't have the sample sizes. But my guess would be that the guys full of mercury are going to have a much lower survivorship. That would be my prediction. All right, that kind of wraps up the research end of things. Any questions while we're here? Yeah. Hey, I live like two miles upstream from Aerostone Park. And uh, I actually moved there on purpose and then spent a lot of time on it. The DEQ activities up by dry cottonwood mm -hmm. has stirred up a bunch of copper sulfate. Mm -hmm. Eight parts per million will kill all the fish. So what are your ospreys going to eat? Cake? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. they're going to die of, yeah. of starvation. Yeah. But yeah. You won't have none to study. Mercury is their last words. Yeah, but no. Hey, what about the fish kill? Yeah, no, uh, it's obviously a, a, a really. I'm not saying there's no, no ospreys because of the arsenic. Well, there won't Ob be any this year. Yeah, so obviously they're, you know, it's, it's hard. Eight, 2018 was incredibly hard. Because hey, with the high, high river, the fishing success was low. We've Plus, had high water before. If they're yeah. stirring it up, man, why don't yeah. you all leave it alone? I'm not, I'm not stirring it up. <laughs> oh, I'm, um, I'm talking about the copper. Yeah. You're killing the fish. All right. Um, yeah. So the, I want to spend a little time now going over some of our educational programs, because this is super, super exciting and a growing, exploding part of what we're doing. And whoops. And so again, this is um, Ray Lynn has um, been sort of uh, helping out, um, overseeing a lot of this. And so everything, again, I'm talking about has been done in collaboration with Ray Lynn. Uh, Delete Guccio um, helps run the educational programs down at the Missoula end. And some of the programs uh, that the SWEFWEP runs is um, four days of uh, visiting classrooms. Um, down at Missoula End targeting fifth grade, and then a full day field trip to the river doing all sorts of cool stuff. So the kids get their mo um, get in the river and do all sorts of neat things, look at macros and water testing and stuff. And the impact of these educational programs has been huge. So uh, there's uh, schools, working with schools in seven counties throughout Montana. And um, I need to update this. Ray Lynn just told me that over 80,000 students, that's right, Ray Lynn? Over 80,000 students, teachers, and other citizens have been you know, getting really good information, we think, about what's going on in the Clark Fork. Um, I also want to tell you a bit about a new program, relatively new program, called Wings Over Water. And this is a, an educational program that I and some others developed based around ospreys. It's a year-long, um, what's called a e environmental STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and math program. And what we do is we bring in some of the best teachers now from all over the world. They spend a week-long workshop with us, and um, we, we teach them about this pretty cool curriculum that we've built up. And it's not a year-long curriculum just about ospreys. That would be so boring and tedious. It's a big bait and switch. So there's, for example, um, a module called How Do Things That Are Heavier Than Air Stay Up in the Air? So it's all about the math and physics and aerodynamics of flight. And there's another one about how does your cell phone know where you are? So it's about satellites and GPS because we use satellites and GPS to track wildlife. And we just got a, a really nice award recognizing this as one of the most innovative um, environmental STEM programs in all of North America. We have never had a, um, a teacher from Butte um, attend this, so um, we'd love to get one. Um, so um, if you can help out um, let, letting folks know, we'd love to see some Butte teachers. So we spend a week with some of the best teachers, again, from all over the place. We indoctrinate them into the true righteous path of ospreys. 
And uh, here I'll talk a little bit about this. This is Iris, a world famous osprey sitting on top of a nest with a camera I run. And we do things like go out and band ospreys. Here's um, a color band we put on so they can be followed around. Uh, the teachers get to visit a, a research grade wind tunnel. And here's holding a peregrine falcon wing and visualizing the airflow over a peregrine wing. Um, we go out and look at planes and aerodynamics of things. Kids build their own wind tunnels out of cardboard boxes and some duct tape, of course, you gotta have duct tape, and a fan. And they build their own airfoils and can do some really cool things um, this way. Uh, this group from Sealy Swan, they also, there was a problem nest of Sam. They were nesting on a high voltage power line and they built their own Osprey uh, platform and worked with Missoula Electric Co-op and um, got the Ospreys off the high voltage power line onto a safer place. So this was a cool project motivated by the kids. It was really neat. Um, here's an Osprey camera. I run the Missoula College. This is when it was being constructed is right here. Um, this, so there's the Grizzly Stadium right across the river. And this camera, it's a soap opera, it's gone viral. It's watched by millions of people in over 200 countries around the world. And Iris is the star of the show. Uh, we call her Iris because she has very distinct dots in her iris, so this is like a fingerprint. It's unique. And so we know, even though she's not banded, every year um, we can look at her eyeballs and we know it's her. She's now the oldest known osprey in the world. She's um, probably around 24, 25 years old, and she's going strong. She's probably fledged about four, at least 40 chicks in her lifetime, we figure. So she's worth her weight in gold. Um, she's a great mama in snow, rain, sunshine. Um, she's, she does it all. Here's trains full of coal, which have a lot of mercury in them, going to China to get burned, releasing that um, mercury up into the atmosphere. Um, and here's one year that um, Iris raised three chicks. This is their crop. This is full of warm, rotting fish. <laughs> you know. And if you had any doubts that birds are dinosaurs, just look at these chicks and you should be convinced that they're living dinosaurs. Um, this is a great book. If you're interested in finding out more about our Osprey project, this is a really cool book. Um, and it won an award for the best STEM book, science book, um, in the world in 2016. And this was due to um, Dorothy Hinshaw Patton and Bill Munoz, the photographer, really, really amazing people. And so um, this is a cool book. And it's, um, again, it's got a lot of information about um, all the stuff from Missoula to here and satellite tracking and everything. All right, I wanted to leave some time for questions, so I gave a great big 35,000 foot overview, and thank you very much, and be happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Gary. Osprey or Osprey?